The next voice you hear may change your life forever. This is the voice of the chaplain of a ministry like no other. Here he is, now making his way to the mic. Please help us in welcoming the chaplain, Chaplain Dennis Keith Hale. Well, hi again and glad of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Chaplain Dennis Keith Hale, and I'm here for our weekly get-together, The Spiritual Side of Cannabis, our ministry, Liar Than Air Ministries, unlike any other ministry in the world. We celebrate and try to understand that spiritual walk that gives us our power and our strength. I want to tell you a couple of quick stories, if I may. When I was a little boy, I would play war in sites where war had been played for real. One of my favorite sites was just across the bridge from where we were living in New London to Groton, Connecticut, and to the highlands there, where it drops off into the coast. And there was found the Fort Griswold, and also the Harkness Memorial, which was a giant sphere, a giant uh, tower, and you could go up there and take a look around. This place for me was a playground. It had the battlements, it had the cannon, it had all the things necessary, and I was unaware of what had happened there really. I would re read it on the plaque, but it didn't really hit home to me that so many men were lost and that this was the first time that the traitor, Benedict Arnold, returned to where he had been formerly the commanding officer and killed people. The same people he had been commanding, he rose against and to show his, his servitude to the uh, crown, a bring, British crown, he led troops up this hill of British troops and killed quite a few people, us, the revolutionaries. I, as a little boy, played there regularly. And my parents were pretty good, but they weren't always as astute as they could be because they were uh, drinkers, heavy drinkers. And my father, having gone through a war, was even reluctant to come near this space for some reason, would often ask my mother to take me there or to bring me back. I knew that my, not, my father was tormented each night with what he had done in World War II. A, a memory of mine is a picture he had of himself holding the severed head of a Japanese saboteur. He struggled with these each night. But I wanted to play there and so they would take me over. Well, I played there one afternoon and I evening started to come around. This was before you could find a phone anywhere or anything. And it was summertime, so the evening was late. But then, around 9 o'clock, no one was still there to pick me up, and I really didn't know how to contact anybody. We were less prepared as children back then. And as it was, I spent the entire night there. And I'm sure now, with hindsight, that it was just the fear that I felt at the time. But as I laid myself down at the foot of the Harkness Memorial, curled up to sleep. I could not sleep at all. My fright turned to wonderment as suddenly people were speaking to me from nowhere. Suddenly I heard the cries of people in battle. I saw flames around me where there were none. I believe I had conjured up in my mind the entire battle as it was read from the plaque on the door. You see, my parents had forgotten me. One thought that the other one had picked me up and they were both acting independently, as they often did, and I was lost in the shuffle. 
had it not been for my brother, who brought it up the next morning. Uh, did you leave Dennis at Grandma's or whatever? They wouldn't have come to get me at all, I guess. No policeman came by, no caretaker, nobody. And that night was full of wild spirits flying around in my head. Jump ahead now for another 15 years. And I had a place I loved going and walking in the sands with my girlfriend or just friends. A place that I later came back to try to surf. Surf Rhode Island. <laughs> and this place was called Napa Tree Point. And it was a wonderful spit of land that sort of went out big wide beaches and and tufts of grass and it really looked idyllic in many ways and I would often go there and try to surf and it was a very difficult place the waves were insufficient usually but on occasion the wind would get up and I would get a little bit of a ride at the same period I was going through a transformation my parents now gone I was in flux. I didn't know what I was doing. So I decided to spend more and more time at the beach and and I loved it so much. Right outside of Westerly, Rhode Island. And this being the 1960s, I felt obligated to try some mind-expanding drug. And so I did. I, I took some LSD upon my arrival there at Napa Tree Point. And I walked out with my surfboard by myself as that I couldn't get anyone else to go with me. And there I tried to ride the waves, what they were, but to no, to no avail. But I sat on the beach, and as I sat on the beach, actually sitting on my surfboard, something came to me. Something came to me that said that my joy, my pleasure at that moment, was felt by others who had a s different reaction to this place, Napa Tree Point. Now, before computers, you may remember, the information that we had wasn't as accessible. We had to go to the library and look things up for very few of us had texts on every subject. And learning how to use the library was essential. Well, I had learned how to use the library, but I hadn't looked this up. And I was walking further out on the tip. I had left my surfboard. You see, there was no one around. Back in those days, nobody stole anything. I left my surfboard and walked all the way out to the point myself. And there, I discovered a person who was crying. And it was a man, and he was probably in his 70s, I guess. And I was concerned for him. I said, sir, is something wrong? Can I help you in some way? And he was staring out at the water. And he told me that he had lost his whole family just 30 years before in the great hurricane of New England and the same hurricane which flooded Hartford, Connecticut where I had lived, the same hurricane which did so much wiped out the town of Putnam, Connecticut. And he told me the story. He told me the story, but he didn't tell me how to, how to understand it. For you see, the big storm came in and took all the houses where I was standing. It was f fully fully built up and took it and washed all the people far away. It took the houses from the land and had them float in the ocean as giant islands of madness. Families were swept away for 10 miles in each direction. And the loss of life was considerable and the pain was also. And there was no building, no one came after this to rebuild this area. In fact, it was really hollowed out for the memory of this event. Well, I had no recollection of this because I was young. No one had told me anything about it. The time I spent in the different places, Watch Hill, Rhode Island to be specific, there were no postcards telling us about it, just laughing faces and a carousel that I was too old to ride, but I would watch for hours, particularly under the influence of LSD. But this man told a story and I had, I had to listen, and his tears kept going, running down his cheeks. And with each one, I felt more obligated to understand the spirituality of the situation. And he did. 
So this week when I was visited by Ellen Harris, a friend from 45 years ago, 48 years ago, I was reminded of those spiritual moments in my life. And sometimes we need this. Occasionally we need this spark from our past. We need the information that we didn't have then, now. So my night spent at Fort Griswold and my day spent with this poor weeping man in Napa Tree Point started my path of tr personal spiritual involvement. I very seldom told anybody about what had happened to me at Fort Griswold, ashamed that my parents had forgotten me and also not sure what was going on in my head for I had never had anything like that happen before. I never had a dream so vivid. And that night, after I had been surfing at Napa Tree Point, I chose not to drive back home. There was no one waiting for me there, but instead drove to a hotel and stayed there for one night. And they were reluctant to even rent to me, and I was a 17-year-old boy, but they did, and this was before you needed a credit card or anything. And I could not sleep. I spent the entire night in personal reflection, angry at myself that I didn't know this information, that I had used this as my playground, when in fact it was hallowed ground, just as Fort Griswold was. So I knew at that point that a spiritual life was something that comes to you and to a, you alone, and it's triggered by so many things. We hope that you have a pleasant spiritual life. We hope that you have enough in your life that your life is full enough that you can enjoy both the sad and happy side of spirituality. I will tell you that the use of marijuana, using marijuana as a spiritual tool, is an important tool. You see, this is nature's tool to get us thinking. This is nature's tool to open up our horizons and to make you feel comfortable enough to really understand it and enjoy it. I hope that you will embrace that as well. I hope that if you don't have a spiritual life that you will get one. I hope that if you are so inclined that you will sit back and really evaluate what's happening in your mind after you do. For you see, nature provided this wonderful medicine, marijuana, and it has been offering us solace, offering us comfort for so many years. And that's because it comes with information attached. I hope that the each, each time you go out, that you look for those spiritual moments in your life and remind yourself that you don't know where they're coming from, but it's nice to see them when they do. On that note, I want to end this week's show. You know, as I often say, I hope that as you go through life, when you need it the most, you find mercy. And as you go, may you go with grace. Good night, and thank you for joining us here on the spiritual side of cannabis. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the end of this week's moment in time with the Lighter Than Air Ministries and the spiritual side of cannabis. Join us next week. Till then, we say good night. Thank <laughs> you.